Hey everybody, it's your girl Bunny. It's Hulu's original series, Wu-Tang, an American Saga, season one, episode six, M possible. So for those of you who are wondering what happened to episodes two, three, and five, they got deleted. Yeah, there was a glitch on YouTube and all of those episodes are gone. Fortunately, I will refilm them and get them up as soon as possible. And as a newbie on YouTube with all of those videos having about two to three hundred views, I'm crushed. But I'll get it done because I love you guys so much. But anywho, episode six, Impossible, that's coming up next. It's Bunny. Opening scene, we have an aerial shot of a bird that's flying through the different burrows. And we see it going from the richest area to the poorest area. And going in, you can make the assumption that this bird somehow, some way is symbolism, which makes a boomerang all the way and throughout the episode. You see Dennis's brother, Darren, and he's confined in his wheelchair and he's looking out of the window and he sees this pigeon and he sees the bas basketball court and he sees that all of these things that he's immobile to do. He can't get up and walk around. He can't get up and play basketball. He is immobile. So he's focused on that and he's deep in thought. One of the things that Darren sees while he looks out of the window is a man who has a hat on, a coat, and a suitcase or a briefcase. The camera pans to following this gentleman in the hat all the way up into the steps of where Bobby lives. And we have Bobby's mother, Lin Linda, who opens the door and she says, Jerome? So we know that Jerome is the father of one of her children. But as the scenes go on, we learn of which child. So we see the man Jerome and he's sitting on the couch with Randy and he's talking about grass and he's talking about Ohio and how he has visions in order to take care of the family and this house that he has in mind. And Ohio has a very large yard and that these are the things that he should look forward to and that he's going to uh, sell a piece of land and get him the land so they can have a big house in Ohio. And Linda comes into the room and she asks them, what are they chit-chatting about? And he tells her there is a company, there is an energy, energy company that's interested in the land and they want the minerals that are on the land. And this is something that I can do for you guys and I know I'm gonna get you a house. She brings him to the other room and she says, look, it's great that you can tell me fairy tales and every now and then lie to me and make promises to me and, and then break those promises. But don't tell Randy that stuff. You know, leave him out of it. He's innocent, he's a child, and don't feed him all of the garbage. And Jerome says, this is not, you know, bogus. This is not something that's a fairy tale. This is real. There is a company that wants to buy this land. And all she could do is just kind of sit back and kind of take his word for it, but who knows? We have Clifford, AKA Shotgun, and he's in his area, you know, at the basketball court and everybody's listening to his song and his album and, and, and the songs that he worked with Bobby with and everybody's giving him shine and they're telling him that he really likes the music. He's, he even has a few girls that come up to him and they give him their number and he's getting some shine. And we see Sha and Power, they come up to the basketball court and they're like, hey man, you know, you got some good music popping. And Sha, he kind of goes off to the side because you can tell he's a little bitter about it that, man, you know, that could have been me. You know, I know how to spit that fire. I know how to do all of that. And he can't help but to sit over there and kind of boil in his thoughts about the shoulda, coulda, wouldas and how I could be getting all this attention from the girls and how everybody could be playing my music in the streets because the, the, the tape... It's being played everywhere and everybody at school and in the park and the neighborhood, they are playing these songs that Clifford and Bobby have 
gotten together and done. And they are playing these songs over and over and over again. So everybody around knows about these songs. The word is getting around about Bobby, that he's an amazing producer and he's making these amazing beats. When they start to do that, you have this older woman who is listening to all of the noise and all of the young kids listening to this music. And she pops out of her window and she says, well, why don't you keep it down? You know, you y'all just go around here and y'all ought to respect somebody. And, you know, she's watching them rough up some, some fiends that are asking for a better price on, on, on a hit. And, you know, they're shooing them away. And the old lady said, you should be ashamed of yourself. The fact that you're treating a black man like that and they're telling her, uh, we're not listening to you whatever the case may be and Hayes he goes over to the window and he says well hi how you doing I just want to say hi and as, as a matter of fact my mother is still enjoying that quilt every winter that you made for her that had all of the jazz music musicians on it so I just want to thank you for that and she says that maybe you can convince your friends to keep it down they listen to you you know you have a strong influence with all of these men around here and maybe if you keep it down it could get a little better so he tries and he says I'll do what I can she then goes into her apartment and you can still see that it's set her furniture and the layout is still in the setting of when she grew up in the 60s she has picture a picture of her husband a wedding picture you can tell from the furniture that it is of her generation and as she's knitting a quilt you see that it's a quilt with freedom and speech and and a silhouette of someone with a fro on this beautiful quilt and she is speaking out loud and she feels that she's talking to her husband and she says do you remember that time when you saw that lady smiling at me and it was this person and oh i can't believe it and man these kids these days need to listen to nina simone and she's just living out her reality as if she's speaking to her deceased husband so we see that brief setting with that character to learn that she was from a group she was from a genre where there was civil rights uh going on where um the the evolution of knowing who you are and standing up for your rights and now she's in this neighborhood that is in this drug crack epidemic and you have all of these youths that are around with no guidance so it seems like she's in this ruckus and whirlwind of loud confusion and not the quiet that she was probably used to when she was younger in that same neighborhood. We then see Bobby, he comes to that same basketball court and he sees everybody else and you see Shy in his own little corner with his arms crossed like listening to that music like, man, I could have killed this. This could have been me, man. This is some BS. And Bobby comes up to him and is like, hey, what's up, Shy? And Shy's just like, so you, you know, you let Shotgun rap over this? You know, you, he was like, yeah. He's like, man, Shy's like, these beats are my life. Like, you should have gave me this. And Bobby says, well, you know, um, we, we, we made the song. Shotgun was ready. And, you know, next time we can, we can see what we can do. But you remember, Bobby talked to Shy in, in the clips that got deleted. <laughs> but Bobby tried to convince Shy to work on his music and that he has a gift but Sha was too caught up in the dope game and is still in the dope game and that was taking up a lot of his time and Sha says well I can't work on my music because I'm working on these streets and so like I mentioned in the other review that Bobby was at that moment and he had that inspiration not to keep waiting on people and coming to the basement and, and putting down their rhymes. Clifford aka Shotgun was ready to go and, and get the tracks, get the music, bring it back to him. Bobby would master it, produce it, and voila. So we see that Shotgun and Bobby are the two that are really going all in with this music so far. Bobby is providing the music, Shotgun's providing the lyrics, and all that is doing is making them even more popular where they're from and people are becoming more familiar with them. Bobby then goes upstairs to one of the buildings and he enters one of the apartments. Clearly it's somebody he knows because he's walking in all friendly like and, you know, didn't even have to knock on the door. And he's 
we see a guy that's at the window and he's looking out of the window and he's listening to the beat of what everybody is listening to and he's just spitting some lyrics to it and Bobby says rebel Rebel, what you doing, man? He's just like, oh, man, you know, I'm just flowing to this beat, man. You know, it's crazy. And Bobby said, whatever you were just doing, you need to write that down because that's nice. And he says, yeah, I'm just looking out this window, and I just noticed people been listening to this music since 8 this morning, you know. And then the fat kid walked across, you know, the one when his mom looks like this. And then... They were still playing the music from when the postman was late on his shift, a little bit after 10.30. So he's really observant about what's going on around him, like an inspector, wink, wink. And Bobby says, man, you know what you remind me of? You know, you you, you just, you, you make good observations. You remind me of the cat, the dude that's on the cartoon, the pink, with the pink panther with the mustache and the magnifying glass. Yeah, like the inspector dude. As Rebel, hey, I just came back to check and see if, you know, you've been selling that little something, something I gave you. And he's like, that tea weed? Because you remember from the other um, review that Dennis and Bobby, they were able to buy some weed, but it wasn't the amount that they thought. But the supplier said, this is strong weed. So they got clever and Bobby wanted, uh, got a good idea to mix tea with some of the weed because the white guys that he was selling it to on Wall Street, they didn't know the difference so we see them and and you know rebel says well i i tried to sell what i could man but it's too cold to be standing out there and bobby says you know it's okay man just give me the money that you got and you know i'll be out your hair and you know rebel's just like well here you go man that's what i got so far and that's that's it bobby's like man that's it and he's like yeah you in a hurry what's going on and how about the beats and he just can't get it all out. Bobby's trying to get out of there because if you remember from the last episode, Linda's sister got them all in some mess by lying and stealing winnings from hitting the number. She lied and she said that her number hit and it didn't. So they're having to pay back Larry's goons and, and, and mobsters and getting that money back. So they're trying to rustle up and get all of this money. So Bobby is still going to all these different sources hustling trying to get this money back because the people that want that money them italians they don't play Bobby comes home and he talks to his mother briefly and says well this is the rest of the money this is what i could get and she's like but that's good that's just enough that's what we need let me go ahead and put this up put put this up and she puts it in a coffee jar and she saves that and that's all going to the pot to give back to larry and his crew for the money that her sister owes them and Bobby notices that, oh, Jerome is here. Um, well, how long he been out? And his mom says, well, he just got out and he showed up on my doorstep like a lost puppy. So, and Bobby says, well, is he staying here? And she says, no, 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 he's not staying here. He's just spending time with Randy. He's just spending time with his son. So we learn that Jerome is Randy's son, indicating that her children in the house, the different children that are there, have different fathers, divine uh, Cherie and Bobby. Cherie has Randy's science project that he was working on the day before and she's looking for Randy because Randy has to go to school and while she's looking for Randy she sees that Randy is with Jerome and he's not in school so she runs up on him like Jerome why isn't Randy in school he needs to be in school and he's missing out on turning in his science project and we notice with Jerome he tells him that's good that you're going to school, but I can teach my son more about the world in one day than he can, than he can go into a class. And Cherie gets very offended because she says, I make sure that Randy gets to school on time. I make sure that he has what he needs. I cook. I step in where I need to step in. What do you do? Putting him in his, it, putting him in check, like saying, you walking around here and shooting the breeze with your son is not consistent. And really putting him in check, like, I do the, the, the work. I do the things that you should be doing. And he says, you know, it's a shame that you've always behaved like a woman. And you've never been a kid. And you've always been the type to think you were grown. But you're not grown. And one of these days, you're going to look back at it. And you're going to wonder where your childhood went. And you're going to get upset about that. Now, there is truth to that. There, there is truth to what he's saying. But if you think about reality and not just the character, but who she is in real life or anybody, 
she noticed that if she didn't do it, who else was going to do it? With the brothers doing their own thing and her mom doing one thing, she really stepped up in knowing that she had to be the woman of the house, that she had to take of her little brother. So I don't know if we're going to see that later on in the series and maybe some anger might build up in her having to be so adult at a young age. We don't know. We, we shall see. Bobby goes back to the record store and the owner says, hey, I'm holding those yellow blank cassette, ta cassette tapes for you, but they're just hit it, sitting here. And Bobby says, yes, I'm just asking you to give me another week. I'm just short on cash right now, but if you just work with me, I promise I'll buy those out. And he says, well, I'll keep them back there, but I can't make you any promises, which makes sense because he's a businessman. I can't just hold on to your word and just think you're going to buy all this out when I might have people that come in here that want to buy it. And as they're talking, Bobby notices some white boys that come from the back door, the back storage room, and they go all the way to the front of the store and they leave. And Bobby was just like, okay, so what was up with that? And the store owner says that those white boys come way over here to get that real ganja, you know, to get that weed. Bobby is just thinking because you know he has this weed that he needs to sell. So you can tell he's thinking some of some ideas of who to sell this weed to. Bobby then tells Dennis, I got this good idea. I know where we can sell this weed. And he takes him to a really white part of town where there's a burger joint and there's a lot of white boys around. And he says, this is where we need to sell the rest of the weed. And Dennis is like, man, it's a lot of white people over here. And, you know, I don't even feel comfortable over here. But Bobby says... That's great, but these white boys are going to buy the weed. And look, no cops. No cops are coming over here. And that's crazy when you think about it because still to this day, the cops are not in white areas where they're doing the same crimes. They're patrolling the black areas. So that was a tidbit in there to let you know that was still happening back then. Devon visits the house and Cherie is in a bad mood and she's still upset from earlier and Devon is just like you know what's up with you and she's like well why are you here and he's like can't a, a brother visit his family like what's up with you like what's wrong and she says Jerome is back and he's acting like we're supposed to kiss his butt because he's back and he kept Brandy out of school today when he had a science project dude like what's what's really going on and Devon tells him you know when you get out of jail you see that the world has moved on without you. When you get out, you try everything to hurry up and, and catch up. So if I was Randy and if I had a choice between spending a day with my dad who I haven't seen in a very long time and going to school, I would miss school. And at least Jerome showing up trying to spend some time with him is better than our dad. So that lets you know that Dennis and uh, Cherie uh, share a father together and that their father is not really involved in their life and Divine is trying to get Cherie to at least see it from a different angle and she says well you know I, I guess you got a point but you know it is what it is after they have this conversation he gets a call back because he wanted to beep somebody with his beeper and she sees that Divine is back on the plug dealing because he goes into his pocket and she sees a little something something Bobby and Dennis can't believe how easy, easy it is to sell this weed, and they are racking up. They are getting a lot of money at this spot. And later on in that day, they're sitting at a nice little burger bench, and they're sitting with this white girl and talking about different music. And she's like, oh, I listen to that, and I listen to this. And Dennis and Bobby are just taking a break, just talking. And they see some white gentlemen come up to the table and say, you know, what are you darkies doing here? Can't you see this burger place is called White's? And, you know, Dennis and Bobby don't want no problems. And Dennis tries to defend what he's saying and to, to get them away from him by throwing uh, a punch because they're basically starting to swarm them, these white guys. And it turns into this big fight and this brawl. And Dennis and Bobby get jumped by some white guys and unfortunately there's someone with a bat that's hitting Bobby and hitting Dennis and they are really getting injured. They rob Bobby and Dennis, they take the money out of their pockets and they run off. One shot that I just thought was really, really messed up and sad is that Bobby is on the ground bleeding from his head and he looks up and he just happens to see a police 
patrol car driving through slowly and observing what's going on. And when he sees that it's a black guy on the ground and bleeding, he looks at Bobby and just keeps driving. Just the ultimate disrespect and what a police officer is not supposed to represent. And Bobby is just like, wow, like, you know, if I was dying, I would just be dead. You didn't even want to help me. Linda goes back to the barbecue joint, goes up to Larry. She has the money in her purse. She takes it out. It's in an envelope. She's like, here, here's all of the money back. He looks into the envelope and he says, be a little short. She was like, no, 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 no. It's, it's all in there. Trust me. He says, well, this is late. The money is late. And with it being late, you've pulled some interest. So you owe me the interest. And I could probably, you know, try to give you some more time, but you're building up interest. And Linda says, can't you put in a good word for me? Can't you see if you could talk to him? And he doesn't say anything. So as she's cleaning up the restaurant and doing the things that she needs to do as the waitress, one of the gangster guys says, you missed the spot. And he spilled some salt on the table. And as she goes to wipe it, he grips her hand and tells her, if I don't get my money back by tomorrow, the interest by tomorrow, there's going to be a lot more that's spilled. And pretty much it's going to be some danger if you don't pay that back. Bobby goes to the ER because his head is gushing blood and Dennis is just like, you're going to need stitches for that. Your head, I, you have a very large gash on your head. And he says, are you going to be okay here? All right here? And that's what really blows me away again is that they're throwing in a lot of socioeconomic lines and things that, uh, that were just really blatant racism still going on in that day and still to this day, unfortunately. The fact that he had to ask him, are you going to be okay? Like, are you sure? Because there were dangers with healthcare facilitators, with doctors, with nurses, just danger everywhere for black people. And he says, yeah, I think I'll be fine. So Bobby says, take this money that I got that's left in my pocket and give it to my mom. So Dennis goes over to Bobby's house and he's looking for her, looking for Linda. He sees her, he gives her the money. It's like, hey, this is from Bobby. And she's like, where is Bobby? I've been paging him all night. And he said, he's in the hospital. And she gets up, he's like, no, 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 he's fine. He slipped on some ice and he just needs some stitches, but he wanted me to give you this. And she looked at it and she's just like, is that it? He's like, yeah, well, that's it. And he sees that she's fidgety and in a hurry and trying to leave. And he tries to touch her and say, is everything all right? Is everything okay? She says, yeah, yeah, everything's fine. I just got to run this errand. And she leaves. As Dennis is about to leave the house, we have Cherie that comes down the stairs. And she says, well, you're not going to say hello? Like, hi. And he says, well, hi, well, what do you, you know, what do you want me to say? I mean, wh where is this going? I mean, do you really think that we're going to be together? Do you really think that we'll be married someday and we're going to have ki kids like Dennis and Darren, which are his brothers? Do you really think that we're going to have that? And, and, and you know what? My brothers need me all the time. I don't think you realize how serious that is. Are you ready for something like that? And she tells him, that's not your decision to make. Like, how dare you put a damper on what I might want? She's like, my brother likes you. My mom offers you food. She, she, she clearly cares for you. I'm almost really an adult woman. You know, I'm about to go to college. Like, I know what I want. So they share an endearing kiss because they haven't talked to one another in a while. Linda, instead of giving the money to the guy that could kill her at any moment for not returning the money, she goes and she takes the money to run numbers. And she is putting a gamble on this money and she bets it on 201. And I'm thinking, woo. I'm glad that I know they are right, but I'm thinking, dang, they about to die. <laughs> See Randy and Jerome, they're walking and talking. And he's like, well, how's everything at home? And Randy is saying, everything's okay. And Jerome says, is your mother seeing anyone special? And he's like, no, I don't think she's seeing anybody special. And he's like, did anybody come to the house? Do you see any gentlemen that come to the house? And he's like, there was one guy that mom works for or likes and they're friends, but it was this guy named Larry. And Jerome's like, Fat Larry? And Randy's like, well, yeah, I guess so. But they showed up to our house and I don't know what they talked about because she told me to go up to my room 
and I couldn't hear anything. But what I do know is it was Larry and two of his friends. And when they left, she looked very sad. So I don't think that mom and Larry are friends anymore. And Jerome is starting to put two and two together because clearly before he went into jail, it was probably known around the block who he was. This next scene was very deep and it was so much information in this one scene that you could dissect into so many different pieces. So we have Hayes, you know, that's that's one of the suppliers that's really cool with Clifford, AKA Shotgun and Rebel. And they're all in the apartment. And as he's preparing to play a little Nintendo, it's so funny because he has one of the, one of the Nintendo cartridges and he's, <sighs> He's blowing, <laughs> he's blowing through the cartridges. And if you grew up playing Nintendo, you knew that was the magic fairy dust that you would put on those Nintendo cartridges for them to work. But they're sitting there and Hayes notices something on the news and he says, man, there's a storm. You know, that's, that's, that's where I need to be, man. I wish I could be helping. And Clifford says, like, why would you want to be over there? And he says, you know, it's one thing to fight for something you fighting for something of good you know and too bad it's just it's, it's a ridiculous thing but sometimes that's what you got to do and as a soldier you're fighting for something or you believe that you're fighting for something and and Clifford just doesn't understand why he's saying something like that but he like okay and he says nah man you know when I was fighting when I was in Berlin you know around the time where they broke down the wall it was beautiful. Once they broke down the wall, you had people on the east side and people on the west side. Once that wall came down, they all gathered around each other and they just wanted to love each other and they just wanted to be around each other. They didn't want that wall. They didn't want that separation. But what it was, the people in power, man, they want pe the people to be divided. They want people to hate one another. And Rebel says, well, I don't see why you would want to fight any war. That's stupid. And Shotgun says, yeah, man, well, you know, and plus them people over there ain't black. So you fighting for some people that ain't even black. And Hayes says, when I went over there, when I was in Germany, man, they treated me like a king. Every pub that I went to, they were buying me drinks and they were cheering and patting me on the back. And, you know, they really loved us over there, man. And he says, well, that's interesting to know. And Hayes is just saying that was honor in being a soldier. So we learn that Hayes served and that he still had those memories of being a soldier and how dedicated that he was and taking him being a soldier very seriously. It is the next day the sun has come up and Linda looks pressed. She's holding the little car that had her 201 number on there. Clearly she lost because she balls it up and she throws it in the trash. She looks like she's been thinking all night long and looks like she's wondering, man, will this be my last day to live? <laughs> she's walking closer to Larry's dressed as if she's going to continue on with her shift. And as she's walking, she sees a black cop that we've seen, that we see frequently throughout the neighborhood talking to people, hey, how you doing, whatever. And she bumps into this black cop and she says, well, you know, hey, how you doing? And she asks how his mother is doing and he's like, she's fine. She still has problems with arthritis, but she'll be okay and she's managing. And she's like, okay, well, well, great. And as she passes him, she sees the two mobsters that she knows she owes money to. And they walked past her and they said, well, you have a great day. And they tip her hat and she's standing there like, hmm, what, why are they passing me? Something, something not right. So she goes into the restaurant and she notices that Jerome and Fat Larry are talking. And when they're talking, she's like, Jerome? And he's like, yeah, how you doing? And she's wondering, so what's going on? And he says, well, you know, you don't have to worry about anything anymore. And she says, well, okay, well, well, thank you. And Larry says, yeah, you know, we're, we're good. So Jerome takes Linda to a hallway where they can talk. And he says, all the stuff that happened in the past, you know, I hope you forgive that. Um, but I need you to trust me. And she looks at him like, <laughs> trust you. Because <laughs> clearly they got some history, okay? And it's evident that he's made promises in the past that he did not keep. And she says, well, yeah, you know, I guess. And he says, I'm not leaving until you say those words that you trust me. And she still can't put the words together. And she's just like, well, I'm so happy you helped. He's like, I'm serious. I'm not moving until you tell me you trust me. She's like, 
all right, I trust you. Because she's like, well, dang, this man ain't going to let me leave until I say I trust him. So she says she trusts him. They're, they share a hug. And it's this undecisive what the heck is going to happen next energy that's in the room. Divine goes to the place where Rico is. And if you remember Rico, Rico was supplying the re-up, fitting the bill for him to have the re-up in the first place. And he goes over to Rico's house and he knocks on the door and the dude answers the door is just like, man, who are you? And he's like, hey man, I'm looking for Rico. And he's like, Rico ain't here. He got picked up by his PO and he ain't gonna be outside or around here for a minute. And they slam the door in his face and Divine's just standing there like, what? the hell because without Rico he ain't gonna be able to move no weight in the hood like anywhere go to the shot again where we see the same older woman she's in the living room and she's trying to focus on her quilt and she's just trying to have some type of peace in her apartment and she's still hearing the crowd outside her window people are freestyling this music and she's looking at the news and she keeps turning the sound up trying to drown them out and it just it just doesn't work so she raises her window and she says, how can you guys just sit here and rap about music? And, and, and you guys, your generation has never had to fight for anything. My generation had to fight for freedom. And because we did that, you guys are out here acting a fool and not doing anything with your time. And she gives this beautiful monologue about being in that age group or civil rights and treating each other with respect and respect and the fact that she's just baffled that in their lyrics they were calling each other B words and, and calling women hoes and all this other stuff and she's just over it. And one of the guys, you know, he's like, that's all fine and dandy, but how about you like this? And he throws a rock into her apartment and it knocks over her coffee and spills all over the quilt that she was working on. She's so frustrated that she calls the cops. And when she calls the cops, she says, yes, I need the cops to come here now. Cause clearly she's over the noise and she's over the disrespect. Guys kind of disperse, but they spread out and they still doing their thing. And we see Shotgun, you know, Clifford walk up and we see Shy and they all starting to freestyle again. And this guy's like, oh man, what you got? You know, looking at Shy, and, and, and Clifford's just like, this man don't rhyme no more. You know, leave him alone. And he looking at Shy like, and he start to spit a verse like, you, 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 you used to rhyme, but now you don't. And he's just killing Shy, looking at him, just spitting this verse. And Shy just can't help it that he can't let this man just charge him up in front of everybody and him not spit some stuff back. And he starts to spit some fire back. And everybody looking at Shy like, okay, all right. The cops show up, see this crowd, tell everybody to just split it up. I don't care what you're doing. Leave, blah, 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 blah. And everybody's just like, man, we just out here chilling. Like, what's what's the problem, man? Like, what's going on? They're like, we got a disturbing the peace call, you know, a disturbance call. Y'all need to shut it up. So then we see Hayes. He pulls up and he telling them like, hey man, you know, this ain't gonna work and they not gonna leave until we all get up on the wall and we just comply. We then see the same black officer that Linda was talking to earlier in the episode. And he's like, hey man, what's going on? And they like, man, you know, they trying to tell us to do this and that and this and this and this. And the cop was just like, oh, y'all shut up. You know, the black officer seemed to have more rage. And Hayes is just like, man, what's the big deal? Like, it's not that serious. You know, I'm a soldier. You know, at least you could do is show me some respect. You walk around here and you're doing all of this and that and the cop shoves him and he shoves him back. And the guy is just, the black cop is just really filled with rage. And Hayes is just like, who you showing out for? You know, these white cops here? Like, what's the deal? And the cop proceeds to put him in a chokehold and tells him, I run these streets and I run these streets and you don't tell me. And everybody's just like, okay, let him go. You choking him. And he's like, I run this and what you gonna say now? And in the meantime, Hayes is patting the cop and he can't breathe. And he's holding him. He's holding him. And people from the windows are like, let him go, man. Hey, let him go. People from the top are yelling. People from the side are yelling. Then you got the white cops trying to hold back the crowd. Meanwhile, the black cop is choking Hayes out all the way until the point where his eyes are starting to roll up. So as that happens, we have Divine. 
now that he has this package, he can't walk around, you know, with the stash in him. He, he'll go back to jail. So he runs to his girlfriend's apartment. He tried to knock on the door and tell her, hey, I need somewhere to stash this. She's like, I'm, tell I'm telling you, and I told you last time, if you're going to do the dope game again, count me out. I'm only for the straight and narrow, not having it. She slows, slams the door in his face, and Devon's trying to think of somewhere to put it. And it looks like he goes into a stairway and puts it into a little dispenser of some sort or a trash chute or something. He drops it in there and he has that look like he's trying to memorize where he's putting it so he could come back for it. When he comes out of the stairway, the cop's like, hey, you know, what are you doing in here? He's like, man, I'm just walking. I'm just trying to get home. And the cop pats him down and doesn't find anything. So gladly, he was able to get rid of that before you know getting caught with it so they proceed downstairs and you can tell the cop is just trying to get him out of the building and as they walk out they see this crowd and people yelling and they see this black cop choking him and the him and divine the, the white cop and divine they kind of run up like man let's see what's going on they get there and the cop is still choking him and choking him and people are like let him go and divine's like you know divine Hayes, is that's his boy you know they go back he's like man let him go he's not even moving and the cop keeps going until he takes this man's life and what makes it even worse the man wasn't even moving he still was choking him and they had to tell him okay let him go he's not even moving anymore and the people on the basketball court people that are looking from the window people that are looking from the staircases you can hear a pin drop and even the white cops are just like, what did you, you know, they had to look like, what did you do, man? And the black cop does this look like he was completely numb to the situation. And then we have the symbolic bird that flies over that situation, flies all the way back to where we see um, Darren, where we see Dennis's brother. And he's still looking out of the window, looking at people walk around. And we then see a montage before the episode ends. Bobby was away from that, so he didn't he doesn't know what happened, but he's walking back home. We then see Linda and Jerome. They're sharing an indulging hug, insinuating that they may get back together if there's something happening with that. We then see Cherie and Dennis. They're walking in the park, holding hands in public, not caring who sees it. And then that is the end of the episode. Very, very sad episode. Um, but sad that it happens every day in America. Cops uh, brutalizing and, and, and killing black men with no sort of uh, justice or punishment. Um, with this episode here, what I said in the other reviews is that certain characters in life we see in this series that Bobby and Shotgun, they were really, really ready to make those moves with being within music. There were several moments throughout the series where Bobby was really inspired to get going and really wanted to just dive in with the music. But the people around him, their minds were, some, were somewhere else. And I said, that just, that's just like life. If there's something that drives you, if there's something that pumps you up to go, you don't have to wait on everybody. And it's a bad decision to wait on everybody around you because everybody else is not going to be inspired like you at the same time. People have different experiences and different jolts to kick, kick them in the butt and saying, hey, you need to do this. Throughout this series, each character has moments, critical moments of what I believe God trying to tell them, this is not where you need to be. I'm trying to push you out of this. I'm trying to get you out of this. You have so much talent. Why are you here? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? And seeing their friend die like that, not even just on this series, but in life. To see not just a person die, but murder, that is, that is such a traumatic, ex I, I, that is such a traumatic experience. Uh, I, like, 
to see this series and learn certain things about the characters makes you appreciate the music even more and makes you appreciate their journey and their struggles and what they saw and what they ingested. And then you hear it come out, the rage and, and killing the beats and killing the mannerisms when they, when they flow. And, and, and you understand and you feel that. So amazing episode, very sad, uh, but it's reality. And it's what they were living and things that they were experiencing, the racism, the police brutality, the socioeconomical difference of what they saw when they were in Manhattan versus when they got back to Staten Island. It's just so much information in this series that you could dissect into another video and just talk about that. But it's a wonderful series. Let me know what you thought. Um, I'm going to get started this weekend on recording those three episodes that got deleted. Hang in there with me, you guys. Please get those views back up <laughs> on those videos that got deleted. I appreciate your time and energy viewing this video. Subscribe. Hit that notification bell so you don't miss any posts. And follow me on Instagram at the same profile name, officialbun underscore E. And remember, whoever subscribes to me, I subscribe back. So I love you guys. Have a good one. See you for the other episodes. Pray for me. I'm going to get them up, y'all. <laughs> Bye. Oh, one thing I forgot. Bonus clip on something I observed from this series is that the bird, as predicted, did symbolize freedom. The woman talking about freedom with the civil, civil rights uh, movement. Freedom in the brother looking outside, Darren looking outside of the window and being completely immobile. It was symbolism that said these men were able mind, body, and spirit to be mobile and to make something happen. They weren't in a wheelchair. They weren't confined. The only thing that was holding them back was them, right? We're our, all, we're our worst enemy. So just my opinion, I don't know if that's what the writers and the director intended, but the bird flight aerial shots, not being bound to something. In several writings, is symbolisms of freedom. Oh, if I was a bird, I could fly away. You hear that in songs, you hear that in books, you hear that in movies. So with that death, it was probably a wake-up call of why am I not kicking my own butt, okay, to make something happen. So we might see that in the next few episodes. We only have seven, eight, nine, and ten left to summarize this up. What I said in the other view is that I believe this series is just get summing up the processes to building up to evolve into Wu-Tang. Because we don't have enough episodes left to get really deep into the music. Because it's too much Wu-Tang music. So it's probably going to let us lead into that one song that really put Wu-Tang on the map everywhere. Um, so that's what I think they're going to do with this series. They're going to build it up and then leave us on that cliff to let us know that there was that hope at the top. And knowing their story now, knowing their history now, we can say they made it, they did it, and here's the struggle that they had to go to in order to become Wu-Tang. So, see you guys next time. Bye. <laughs>